Hello and welcome to Game Check. This time we're talking about games we just like to pull off the shelf and play that are, you know, pick up and play kind of stuff. Yeah, and I know something else you like to pull out and play sometimes, but usually not while you're playing these games, right? Maybe. <laughs> I, I do too. So anyways, why don't we just get on to the episode because people don't want to hear this stuff, so... Here's Super Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo. This might be one of my favorite quick play games as it's just that. You can breeze through any of the cups in the Grand Prix in 10 minutes or less. There's enough variety in the tracks to keep me coming back for more and of course I usually play for way more than 10 minutes since it's so addictive. The character roster is perfect for all types of players. I personally love the smaller characters like Toad or Koopa since they're quicker off the line and take corners easier. But with those awesome attributes, it leaves them vulnerable to fatter characters like Donkey Kong and Bowser. One good hit from these heavyweights and you're tossed aside like a used condom. Still, they're the best in my opinion. I've always loved the idea of having weapons in this game, mainly because the rubber band effect isn't here and if you're gonna win, you've gotta do it with your own skill. A nicely shot red shell or a mushroom for a speed boost can help you make up a lot of ground if you're behind. And probably the best thing is that there's no blue shell in this game. I wish Nintendo hadn't invented that stupid thing as it's caused me to lose a lot of races in successive games. You know, it sometimes pisses me off that Nintendo does these little things just to create what they call a competitive race. I say if you don't have the skills, you should earn them by practicing. You know, that's the true way to get better at games. Alright, I'm done with my little rant. Anyway, the racing here is always frantic, and if you're in first, the AI will cheat a little bit and always have something that's going to screw you up, whether it be a star or a mushroom that'll make you small. It happens all the time, and to me it adds a lot of extra challenge dodging them while you're trying to retain first place. All I know is that if I'm in the mood for a quick game that's different than the rest, Super Mario Kart is always there. Ghouls and Ghosts on the Sega Genesis is one that I constantly pull down from the shelf to play. It's a great port of the arcade, at least it was for the time it was released. Out of all the versions of Ghouls and Ghosts, this one is the easiest. For some reason, it defaults to practice, but I always put it on the professional difficulty since, well, you get the idea. Anyone can beat this the second or third time they play it. I know this because I can beat it and lots of you like to tell me that I suck at games. Actually, I'm kidding, I've had this one since launch and it probably took me a few more times than that to beat it. There's five very unique stages here and stage bosses. I like how the first and second parts of each stage are also quite different, at least up until stage five. Each boss even has its own theme music. Yes, since it's in the Ghosts and Goblins franchise, that means you'll get the fake ending and you'll need to run through all five stages again. Since I pulled this one down so often, I'm usually able to beat it in just over 30 minutes. That's going through the entire thing both times on Professional. And I love every minute of it, even if there are very few of those minutes in the game. I can't imagine playing this and not beating it. I'd feel as if I let the game down. It's one of the earliest titles on the system, so there's some goofy stuff here and there like enemies not always appearing or sounds not always sounding right. Still, I can't recommend this one enough. If you've never played any version of Ghouls and Ghosts, you are absolutely missing out on a great game. This is Wendy, Every Which Way for the Game Boy Color. Wow, what a great title for a porn movie, right? Hell, I'd watch it just to see how many ways Wendy does it. Well, hearing it is definitely different from reading it, and as you can see, the game is about a witch named Wendy. And believe it or not, Wendy was even before my time and was part of Harvey Comics' Casper the Friendly Ghost and Friends way back in the 1950s. Way Forward, who in my opinion is an awesome developer, took the helm on this title and made a really fun action platformer. Being a witch, Wendy has the ability to defy gravity and walk on ceilings whenever she wants. This makes for some very fun gameplay and will test your platforming skills. Well, not so much in the first few worlds as they're basic and feel like they were developed for little kids. But if you're patient and make it through the first 15 minutes it takes to get to the third world, things get very interesting and really fun. You actually need to think a little bit about how you're going to make it through each level's traps and pitfalls. The only thing that's really missing from this game are the boss fights. 
But there is a final boss, however. At the end of each world, you have a bonus level instead. This bonus level is simply a shooter that even I have no problems getting past. They're far from challenging, but they do break up the gameplay a bit. In all the levels, Wendy collects stars that'll not only let her take more hits, but they'll power up her attack. She has a projectile that will cover more area as your stars increase. Strangely though, the enemies will die with one hit no matter how many stars you have. If you play this game on a Game Boy Advance or on the Game Boy Player on the GameCube like I'm doing here, you automatically unlock three more levels to play through. I like this as the game punishes you if you only have a lowly Game Boy Color. I've only owned this game for about four years now and found it at that flea market here in Denver. Yeah, that's not a long time, but I've probably beaten it at least ten times in those four years. I find myself coming back to it and playing through it every so often as it's just a fun game to play. It's very well developed and can be beaten in easily under 45 minutes. Ghost House on the Master System is one that I like to play often for about a half hour or so. In the US, it was released as a card game, and that's originally why I bought it. I just really wanted to have a game on one of these cool cards, and this was the best one to get. My original card isn't in good shape now, and no, I don't know exactly what happened to it. But a few years ago, I bought another copy to replace it. However, I'm playing the game from my original broken card for this episode, so yes, it still works. Anyway, you're Mick, and you've just inherited the family jewels. But to get them, you'll need to defeat a whole mess of Draculas. To do this, you'll need to attack the enemies to get a key. Once you have a key, you can walk across a closed coffin to awaken the Dracula inside. Defeat him, and you'll collect a heart which restores your life. After you defeat all five Draculas, you get a family jewel and get taken to the next level where five more Draculas await along with another jewel. You can jump on most enemies at an angle to defeat them. Well, except for Dracula. You can also get knives by jumping or walking in front of a candelabra on the wall. They fire out at you from the side of the screen, and if you jump and land on the knife, you get it. This makes you more powerful, but it doesn't last forever. Jumping and hitting an overhead light freezes the enemies for a bit, but you can only do this a limited amount of times. Also, if you press up at any window, you'll warp to a different location within the house. It seems random, but it's not, so you'll have to learn them. But it can make for a nice quick escape if you need it. The jump and attack buttons are backwards on the controller, but amazingly, it's easy to get used to. Once you learn the game, it becomes so simple and fun. It really is the best card game, but in most other countries, I believe it was released on a regular cartridge, which of course makes it less fun. I'm kidding, this game is fun no matter how you play it. Gunsmoke on the NES by Capcom is a game that I take down regularly for a quick play. And I do mean a quick play, as I'm usually watching the ending less than 30 minutes after I push start. It wasn't always like that though, as there was a time when I was really horrible at this game and I couldn't beat it. Many factors contributed to this. Firstly, every level you have to find a hidden wanted poster if you want to make it to the boss. Yeah, you could buy one along the way, but that wasn't any fun and they're super expensive. Secondly, after the second stage, enemies start coming at you from behind and trap you if you don't keep moving. That's probably the thing I hated the most. I know for a fact that I've broken at least one NES pad while playing this game. I just couldn't get my fingers to tap the A and B buttons quick enough to keep up a steady rate of fire and that's what you need to kill the hordes of enemies on each stage. Sure, I'd buy the different weapons from your so-called allies, but they don't last long. Then I got the NES Advantage and that all changed. I'm pretty sure I beat the game very soon after I got the controller thanks to the turbo buttons. Some people might say it's cheating, but for me it's just literally having the advantage. The game is still just as fun to play for me as it's always been. I have a lot of really good memories surrounding this title. Like when we'd go to our family cabin in the mountains and I'd bring my NES. The game's Wild West setting felt like what I was experiencing in the isolated mountain surroundings. As stupid as it sounds, when I wasn't playing the game, I'd be outside running around pretending I was shooting bad guys and then taking over the area. I'd eventually meet the final boss and take him out with my amazing imaginary gun skills. <laughs> Such good times. Nowadays when I play, I just appreciate everything about this title. 
like the constant thudding of the dead bodies as you kill your enemies. That sound is embedded in my mind forever along with the solid soundtrack. The music really has a great western feel to it and it just completes the atmosphere of each stage. One of these days I'll play the game again with just the regular old NES pad and see how I do. I think by now I should know where everything is and I shouldn't have many problems beating it, but we'll see. So far, we got some good games that are just fun to pull down from the shelf and play. Good quick fix. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. And why don't we play some more? The Legendary Axe for the Turbo Graphic 16 is always one of the first games I pop in if I want to test the system or just experience a little turbo goodness. It's one of the earliest games for the system in the West. It's just really fun, and I like the feeling that the control gives you. You gotta power yourself up through the game, and it's a slow process, but you never lose your interest. The visuals are pretty good for the time since the NES was the norm, and a lot of the music is excellent. It's also an easy game to get into once you understand how it works, which really doesn't take that long at all. When you die, you do lose some power, but the game gives that back to you pretty much right away, so you never feel completely helpless. Honestly, I've still never beaten this game, and I always keep continuing and trying. Some of the bosses can be really tough and will make short work of you. Well, at least me anyway. Still, there's something about this one that makes you want to keep on playing. It's a great game to show off your turbo graphics or PC Engine or whatever it is that you have that can play this game. I just like powering it up to spend a few minutes with it and then suddenly I find myself more than halfway through the game. The Legendary Axe 2 is also another good game I like to jump into a lot. This game is a lot darker, literally, and it really doesn't have anything at all to do with the first game. But still, it's loads of fun. You play the role of the hero, and he's attempting to defeat the villain. That's all you really need to know, and honestly, you don't even need to know that. By the way, the villain is your brother, but you didn't hear that from me. You don't need any armor, or clothes for that matter. The jumping physics in this game can take a while to get used to. I love the music and sound in this one, and I think that has a lot to do with why I personally play it so often. I also like the feeling of the rapid fire chain whip thingy, and I recommend that you play this one with the turbo fire all the way up. Even using any of the other weapons except for the slow axe feels very, very nice. Still though, when I run out of lives, I never bother continuing because by then I'm satisfied and I've had my fill. However, it's a good one to play for 20 minutes or so to get your RAS stand fix on your Turbo Graphic 16, or PC Engine, or Turbo Duo, or PC Engine Duo, or PC Engine Duo R, or Super Graphics, or PC Engine Shuttle, or Core Graphics, or Core Graphics 2, or Turbo Express. Ah, geez, and I know there's more out there too. There's a game by Sega that easily fits this category. It's Golden Axe and you all know that I'm a big fan of these games. I even wear a Golden Axe shirt from time to time on the show. Hell, I'm even wearing it today. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? And you know what? I look pretty darn good wearing it, don't I? <laughs> I think so. But anyways, yes, I play this game many times a year. I remember when it first came out, I was immediately drawn in by the art and the game setting. I was a big fan of Barbarian movies, especially Conan, and to be able to play a game like this was the icing on the cake. It didn't disappoint, and it still doesn't. I like the character choices that you can play as, and I usually choose Tyrus. Not because she's really hot in her panties and bra, and she is, but because I like her magic the best. It takes way more blue potions to get it to full strength, but fire magic is the best. I like the forms that it takes from a fire ghost thing to the huge silver dragon that comes in and breathes his fire breath on your enemies to harm them. I'm just saying that dragon breath should kill every enemy on screen in an instant, but that would be unfair, I guess. Speaking of unfair, you've got to constantly keep moving or your enemies will get on both sides of you and then you're done. They'll constantly hack at you and you won't have much of a chance. I love all the areas where you have the advantage though, where you can move close to a cliff edge and enemies will come on screen and just walk off the side. You know, that helps out quite a bit. 
but I'm just as clumsy at times and will walk off the side myself. The game isn't that long and can be beaten in roughly 30 minutes, which makes it the perfect game for a quick play. Sadly, the last stage is tough enough that I can't beat it every time I play it. It's okay though, because I have a lot of fun getting to that point. And to add to the experience, the music is really enjoyable. If I were trapped on a deserted island with an AC power source, this might be in the top five games I'd take. R-Type on the TurboGrafx-16 is always a fun one to sink a few minutes into, and I do mean a few, particularly the Japanese PC Engine version of the game. Why is that? Well, in Japan, the PC Engine Hue Card Media was originally too weak to hold an entire game on a single card. That was just asking way, way, way too much. They say it can't be done, that it's just an impossible dream. A whole game on a single card? Get out of here! So they split the game onto two cards, the first four levels on part one and the last four levels on part two. For the North American release, special scientific discoveries were made which allowed the entire game to fit onto a single Hue card. Do you suppose this freak accident? Of course. That's it. That's the answer. We've done it. But honestly, I feel that the game is made better by not having the last four levels here. I know, that sounds like an extremely stupid thing to say, right? But come on, you don't want to deal with the burden of a full game. Oh no, no. That's no kind of a thing to say. The first half of the game drips with personality and original design. Lots of cool aliens, stage designs, and enemy patterns. The second half of the game, or part two on the PC Engine, it seems like the developers became bored as everything is super repetitive and as a player, you'll get bored here fast. So part one on the PC Engine is the version of our type to have. I've said it before, but the music here is my favorite rendition, and I like it better than the arcade music and the later released PC Engine R-Type Complete CD game. How about that? If you beat part one on the PC Engine, you get a pseudo ending which shows your ship docking and settling down, at least for now. Then you're presented with a special code that you can put into R-Type part two if you want to continue with the same power-ups that you just earned in part one. That's neat if you want to play the last four stages, but why bother? Just play the first four here in part one again. What has God wrought? If you do well, you can get through this entire hue card in under 10 minutes. If you die and continue a few times, you might be able to stretch that out to 15 minutes or so. But that might just be the perfect amount of time to embrace in some sweet shooter action before you go to school, work, or have to see your parole officer. Check it out. Good, good, beautiful. Castle of Illusion on the Genesis is an amazing game and I almost picked it for this episode. But the Master System has a version as well and it's not talked about a lot even though it's also a great game. Well I'm going to talk about it because I really like this one. While a different game than the Genesis version, Mickey controls the same for the most part with his butt bounce. But he also has another move at his disposal, he can pick things up. This is good for many things. You can throw items at your enemies to kill them. You can also pick up treasure chests and throw them to open them. But of course you can also butt bounce on treasure chests. And you can carry these barrels around and use them to reach higher areas. It's a dramatic difference compared to the Genesis title. This game also features many hidden items. Treasure chests will appear if you jump in the right spot. There's also lots of secret paths to find for more treasure. And levels usually have more than one way to get through them to fight the boss. I like that Sega kept the music and the idea is the same as the Genesis version but also build upon them. You'll see different graphics and lots of different enemies and of course level bosses are all different. Even the final boss fight looks radically different and also the fact that you have to fight two bosses. Instead of just a dumbed down port, Sega went all out and you can tell a lot of love has been put into this title. Mickey has lots of animation and the game has some really amazing graphics for the Master System. And the music like I said is the same but it has that simpleness that I've come to love about the Master System sound chip. It feels a little bit the same but also very unique and that's all good in my book. I really like to take this game down and beat it at least once a year. And that's usually not a problem since it only takes about an hour of your time to get through at the most.
Shadow Dancer on the Genesis is an amazing game that's easy to pull down and blast through. We very briefly mentioned this one a couple of episodes ago, I know. Basically, you're Joe Musashi and this time you're fighting Union Lizard, but this time you've brought your pooch with you. You've got unlimited shurikens and your sword when you're close to enemies. But you can charge your dog and he can hold some of the enemies so they can't shoot at you until you can get up to them and kill them. Be careful though because he can't hold the enemies forever. And if he gets hurt, he'll turn into a puppy for a short time. You can also use ninja magic once per stage. Oh my god, I sounded like an idiot there. Oh well, F you, I'm not changing it. Your goal in most stages is to rescue all of the hostages. The one female captive in each area will power up your attacks. Once you get all of the hostages, you're allowed to exit. This game has tons of action, and it'll always keep you on your toes during the short time you spend with it. The action is so good that you won't care that there's no slothful turn-based battles or giant towns to explore with people to slowly talk to for 140 hours. Nah, no, this game requires actual physical skill with a controller and dexterity to win. I mean, not a ton, but enough. It's just a super easy game to get into, and that's why it gets pulled down from my shelf so often. It sure as hell isn't because of the awful box art. But maybe it could be because of the sweet beatboxing music in the bonus stages? The game can get a teensy bit challenging towards the end, but anyone should be able to beat it without any issues. If you want a real challenge, try turning the shurikens off in the options screen. Now you can't throw any ninja stars at all. Well, except during the boss fights. How far can you get in this mode? Actually, you know what? I think this mode might be a little easier because I got to the end faster than usual. Shadow Dancer on the Genesis is one of the best shinobi games, and it's super underrated. And it's way better than the arcade version, and especially the Master System versions of the same name. Get it. Well, there you go, a bunch of games that we like to take down from our shelves and play through once in a while, and how many times have you beaten Golden Axe, Joe? Golden Axe? Yes. Probably not as often <laughs> as you. And I, like I said, I don't beat it all the time, so it's it's not that easy. How many times have you beaten Ghouls and Ghosts? Not as many as you. <laughs> you should, because anyone can beat it. Yeah, anyone can beat it, it's super easy. Anyway, what are some games that you guys like to pull down from the shelf and just play through just when you just need a quick game fix. Let us know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. got a coveted box of Super Mario cereal and I really want to eat you but I'm gonna do the right thing and hold on to you for five years and sell you for 20 maybe maybe 40,000 bucks now oh, that bastard has all my snatchers here somewhere this is a snatcher Oh, hello. I've been curious about you. Wait a minute. Oh, I knew it. Same damn taste. Exactly the same. Oh, my cereal! Dude, where the hell are all my damn Snatchers? Snatchers? I sell them all on eBay. Buy all my Snatchers on eBay. Wow, that tastes like my Nintendo Switch games. <laughs>